Hey, what's up, party people? I'm Party Planner Preston, your ultimate reviewer and entertainment DJ. A lot of time has gone by since the release of the final season of Trollstopia, and unsurprisingly, there have been many reactions to Trollstopia as a whole. Some love it, some hate it, and some are mixed about it, which, given the Troll's climate online, is not that shocking. However, there has been one argument that's been coming up when talking about Trollstopia, and that's even stronger praise for Trolls The Beat Goes On. Where did this come from? We followed a specific rule. The sequels are better, since Trolls World Tour was seemingly better than the original, and Trolls Holiday in Harmony was leagues better than the original Holiday Special. That seemed to be the consensus for a while. So, where did this come from? With Trollstopia having smoother animation, a stronger sense of creativity in the beginning, and a potential diamond mine of ideas and stories to explore, how is it being seen as inferior? Especially since we have things like this. This... Poppy, look. I love how much you love your friends, but sometimes loving your friends means letting them make their own decisions. You think so? I do. And this... Always. Well, it's complicated. So after completing Trollstopia, I was compelled to watch B Goes On again. No skip-throughs, no skimming, and I had to watch everything in close detail. I mean, Trollstopia is now part of the franchise's lineup. Most people in the fandom know the original, the first holiday special, and Trolls World Tour very well, but when people see something like Trolls The Beat Goes On and Trollstopia as a kind of in-between movies and holiday specials as well as seeing characters from Trollstopia in Holiday and Harmony, it's kind of hard to not think about how the series and movies, in their own way, can flow as one narrative for the Trolls universe. What only appears in the shows and not the movies, and vice versa. In doing so, and seeing more arguments come in that there was something important in Trolls The Beat Goes On that wasn't in Trollstopia, I can see what people are talking about. Sure, I've had my ups and downs with Trollstopia, but there's none of them I genuinely hate, and parts of it even gave me a stronger sense of what the franchise is all about that I can't remember feeling since the first movies. However, something was missing that Trolls the Beat Goes On seemed to have. It wasn't until I saw Season 4 that I started to notice it in some way, and then it became apparent in the last two seasons when I finally felt this, but I did feel it. That being an emptiness, a lack of passion, a feeling that this isn't being made to delight the imagination or expand on ideas for the Trolls universe and narrative anymore. But Trolls the Beat Goes On had that? I argue, yeah. It isn't exactly the most noticeable, but I did get that feeling from the show. To better explain my thoughts and what I'm talking about, we have to go over Beat Goes On seasons quickly. I'm aware you guys know them inside and out, but to get a better idea, we have to recap them. Season 1 was okay. I was a little too harsh on the premiere, as it knew how to go from the first movie into the episodic format of the show. It had a bit of a slow start, but it starts to pick up by the third episode. There were plenty of good episodes with funny jokes and intriguing ideas, on top of some bad ones that either felt annoying as it started tropes that would become common in the show, or it would anger me from how bad the plot structure can make an episode feel very confusing, with crappy character decisions and a bit of lackluster writing, giving us an okay start from an inconsistent line of quality through each episode. In Season 2, it seemed like the writers wanted to try something different, and create some kind of conflict, running gag, and formula, especially with the petty broppy competitions and fights. The Brand says something rational to which the others say the same thing or say the opposite, and when he objects to it, the others talk over him, running gag. And the mediocre Satin and Chenille episodes that focus a lot on fashion. While there were plenty of good episodes and creative ideas that tried something new, that doesn't mean every idea is good. 
Because of episode quality inconsistency and a bit of a mean-spirited nature in episodes like Trolley Tales, the formulaic format of specific episodes, and entertaining me the least of all the seasons, I didn't like this season too much. The third season finally got things back on track in a better way, as the episode quality got stronger. The episodic format quality became more consistent. It entertained me more, the ideas got more creative, and it had the least bad episodes of the original seasons. The fourth season was about the same quality, but it introduced something that would become more apparent in Trollstopia, but would only appear about a few times in B Goes On. The bland silver rating. See, in the past, I've always defined the silver episodes as good, but not fun enough to get the gold. However, if a silver episode doesn't quite go the mile in trying to entertain the audience watching it, can waste time based on where everything and everyone ends up in the end, or doesn't seem memorable or leave any impact, good or bad, it comes across as bland. As you can imagine, this kind of bland mush kills a silver episode on the spot. And as you'll see later, this occurred in Trollstopia consistently in the current seasons. So season 4 is very good, but it does have qualities that rank it below season 3. By the time we reached season 5, we were starting to get a stronger quality consistency back. A lot more creative potential with the world, more entertaining feels, more funny jokes, and overall a good story flow that happened in season 3 as well, whether it had an ongoing narrative or not. Season 5 would quickly become my favorite of the modern seasons of B Goes On. But how would the others play out? Season 6 would be a step down for me, as so much of Season 6 felt forgettable and only passable. The only reason I remember an episode like Marsh Tato Fairy is because Marsh Tato Mary comes back in Trollstopia and the Broppy. It was a case in which there were only specific reasons that episodes are remembered. Hairball for the Broppy, Blank Day for the Broppy, Hug Fest for the Broppy, Giggle Yum for the Song, and Broppy. A flower for Poppy for the emotional moment in the end, and so on. It entertained me the least, the stories felt a little safe, the comedy is just okay, and the ideas don't exactly reach their fullest potential. Overall, it's my second least favorite season of the show. Season 7 brought back a lot of creativity. An intriguing idea with an episode that doesn't have Poppy or Branch in it, a stronger emotional feel in some episodes, better tension in episodes like Troll Playing Game, and keeping up with Season 5 and 3 in terms of quality. Season 8 was a small step downhill, as the episode ideas were a little less intriguing and the comedy is a little less funny, except for What Did I Miss? There were still some bad Krieg and Cloud Guy episodes, but the comedy is just okay. And once again, some of these ideas don't reach their full potential. Overall, I'd rank each section of seasons, calling the original seasons the cake seasons, and the modern seasons the cookie seasons. I'd rank season 3 in first, and season 2 in last for the cake seasons. Basically, it's season 3 in first, season 4 in second, season 1 in third, and season 2 in last. For the cookie seasons, I'd rank season 5 as the best, and 6 as the least good. Basically, Season 5 in 1st, Season 7 in 2nd, Season 8 in 3rd, and Season 6 in last. Altogether, it's Season 5, Season 3, Season 7, Season 4, Season 8, Season 1, Season 6, and Season 2. The pros and cons of the show were much more noticeable on the rewatch. The pros come down to the storytelling. As they had good plot lines, especially with the cliffhanger finales and how each season starts exactly where the last season left off in terms of plot or story idea, which would keep people on their toes as the show continued, leaving each season with something that people could gain. Animation As it has improved with each season, while it looks a little cheap and easy, it does have detail for each troll design, and it is expressive and colorful. As the seasons go on, it gets more beautiful based on things like glowing hair and the gems, the dark underwater moments, and so much more. Creative Ideas As I have seen a lot of intriguing ideas that I would have loved to see more of. They're not exactly ideas everyone would love, but for Trolls fans like myself, these were inventive. And Characterization As the show added personalities to characters we don't see that much in the movies which gives them a layer of depth. 
I was intrigued by how the creators, writers, and more were able to work with what little the movie showed for these characters and gave them some details that add to what kind of character the Snack Pack members are. Even the new trolls that we see in the shows have so much more personality. As for the negatives, Becos On has a strong formulaic episodic format that can get a little boring, especially with the Cloud Guy formula that can get annoying. There are a few lip syncing errors that pop up through each of the seasons because of obvious times that they recorded a line, lip synced it, and then replaced it with a different iteration of the line to which they didn't go back and replace it. There's at least one animation error in Royal Review with a tuft of Poppy's hair being cut off, and it isn't because of a framing issue. But luckily, this only occurs once. Some storytelling details were not fleshed out enough, as it felt like the writers wrote characters and plotlines for a season ending and beginning, but then afterwards it's not really explored again. The biggest example of this is the Party Crasher thing from Season 3 continuing to Season 4. After Party Crashed in Season 4, when Archer becomes a troll, we never see him again. This was such a bad problem that Tour Guide of Duty literally had the trolls question where he is because his absence is just so noticeable. The times the other trolls, including Poppy, have situations where they pick on Branch a little too much gets really annoying to put up with the more it continues. I know these are supposed to be for comedy, but it really isn't that funny. The running gag isn't funny. These were common problems that I've noticed the more I kept watching, but even then, a lot of fans decided to overlook these issues and continue watching anyway. And for that, rock on. So the question becomes, if Beat Goes On seems okay and good, what caused Trolls fans to decide that Trollstopia was inferior? Well, let's look at Trollstopia to find out. So in November of 2020, Trollstopia would air on Hulu and Peacock after World Tour had been out for several months. Everyone was excited for this series, with the same writers coming back for this show, and even the same actors with a brand new cast for brand new characters. People were so excited that there was an accidental leak of footage from an episode of the show, to which the creators were a little worried about how we would receive the show based on this little leak. By the time it came out, people perceived mostly positive things about the beginning. While I do think season 1 is a pretty good season, it's not perfect. Over time, my girlfriend helped me notice some things that felt prominent the more I thought about it. Arifa mentioned how season 1 felt a little too moral based, and I agree. There were so many times in which the show resorted to teaching a lesson in some way. The episodes I feel like didn't need to have a moral but do anyway were Bring It In, Girls Night, and Buck and Branch. Season 1 is also crowded and seems a little long. It looks like the writers felt like they wanted to make sure they put their best foot forward and made the season 13 episodes long instead of the typical 6-7 to seven episode format like the others. Season 2 would come out and while the beginning and the middle aren't as strong as season 1, the last episodes felt pretty strong and the creative ideas still kept themselves consistent. We even got the diamond ranking in Piney and Lord Prickles, which turned the tables from my ranking system and turn what seemed like an okay concept into an emotional powerhouse with Poppy's song and seeing her with her hair down. Season 3 still wasn't as strong as Season 1, but it was still keeping some form of consistency. It's definitely not as good as Season 2, and I changed my ranking of the Fabron from Diamond to Platinum because the moral and the Brobby were the main reasons the episode was as loved as it was. Otherwise, it's pretty good, but not quite diamond-worthy or emotional at its strongest. Then Season 4 would hit, and I immediately felt the effects and the downward spiral of quality. Not only did that season give us Shiny Diamond, my first bronze ranking of the series, but it also introduced something I'd get frustrated with, and that was the formulaic Val Needs to Learn a Lesson episodes. Because the writers felt like they were out of ideas, they would have moments where they would change up Val's writing and basically bring her back to her attitude in season one. I know that Val isn't always going to act like her developed self, but it still doesn't make any sense for her to not really see her friend's wishes in Haroldine the Musical, in which she keeps on finding ways to get out of Holly's play and has to learn a lesson of going back and doing the play. You'd think that Val would be a little more understanding of the play, as Holly has been her friend for a while. It's like the writers forgot about the Fabron, 
and some bits of Piney and Lord Prickles, where she said to Poppy, mind you, If this you and me thing is gonna work, you can't always be the one who is there for me. You've gotta let me be there for you, too. Otherwise, we lack a relational foundation of trust and mutual respect. I don't think it's the writer's fault in any way, but it is a little clumsy. Like they focused on Val's personality of wanting to do the cool thing in the short run of continuity and not the long run across the entire series. This same thing happened again in season 7 and while it isn't as forced as it is in season 4, it is still noticeable. It gets even more distracting when you have an episode in which Poppy and Holly go on a trip with Val in season 7 and they're worried that if they say the location sucks, that this would automatically make her feel like they're not grateful or that Val's development wouldn't stick. It's the most odd thing in the world that it feels distracting. Season 4 was a definite step down. At that point, I noticed Trollstopia's main problem, but I wasn't definitive about if this was truly the case, and I waited on Season 5 to see if it stuck. Season 5 would come out and it really improved things. The quality was back on track, the creative ideas were better, the laughs were better, it gave us our first blue diamond of the series after Holiday and Harmony, The Search for Peace, which remains my favorite episode of Trollstopia for all the reasons you could expect. The Broppy's great, the emotion's great, the moral is fantastic, Grandma Rosie Pop's messages, and that it's the same voice actor from the original Trolls movie, and the title, as it give, give off a double meaning because it's called The Search for Peace and not The Search for THE Peace. I thought maybe Trollstopia could keep this up. However, it started to decrease in quality yet again. When the trailer got less eye-catching and my reaction streams got less and less views per season, this is when it really got evident. Season 6 was another step down from the previous season, as it felt like a lot of the ideas they create didn't reach their fullest potential. I do love the fact that Cloudback Whale was an episode in which it could be a great Poppy episode, but a bad Cloud Guy episode, and Be My Val in Time was really sweet to see. However, besides that, it was pretty much the same old, same old. This is where I noticed one of Trollstopia's main flaws, quantity over quality. Because they felt like they had to reach a deadline for these episodes, or because they felt like they had to reach a specific number of episodes, they don't have much time to write something that feels investing, or could grab an audience's attention and stick to what's worked in the past. Which can be fine for some time, but after a while, it becomes a formulaic thing, which can result in pandering. Well, this worked in the past, and it entertained our audiences, so they'll be okay with it again. The, if it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude. I've always followed the message that the Nostalgia Critic said in his Cat in the Hat review. Quote, Have you ever considered the possibility that maybe people don't know what's best for them, and by continually giving them the same crap, they'll never know what's different, so they'll just keep asking for the same crap? This is the perfect example of that. While there are a few good things, this felt like a really safe season that I quickly forgot about, except for Be My Val in Time and Cloudback Whale. Season 6 is my least favorite season of the show. It's a season I genuinely think is bad. Not because it actually sucks in story or anything, it's because it feels dull and lifeless. Then we have our final season, Season 7. This season was a step up from Season 6 and was better, but not much else. Some episodes still felt like fillers, it finally gave a conclusion to Chaz, Pushy Poppy, and Marsh Tato Mary that I found genuinely great, and still felt like the same old same old with a finale that I found pretty good enough to get a platinum, but not much higher, because there's not a strong emotional feel when you know that DJ is leaving for a year. I know that that reflects a sense of moving on or seeing someone go for a long time that has always stayed with you, or you stayed with others, and that's great to see Trolls tackle, but I didn't feel it as strongly as Piney and Lord Prickles or The Search for Peace. The ending did feel nice though, with the Trolls singing the song from the opening theme in a soft format while they hold hands, and Poppy says, worth it. I like that it was an ending that felt earned in some way, and that the opening theme wasn't just an opening theme. It felt like something more, and that it built up something. While I don't think it's a perfect ending, it is satisfactory and good. With that said, let's get to the rankings. Cake Seasons will be Seasons 1, 2, and 3, 
Cookie seasons will be four, five, six, and seven. Out of the cake season, season two is in first, and three is in last. Season two in first, season one in second, and season three in last. Out of the cookie season, season five is in first, and six is in last. Season five in first, season seven in second, season four in third, and season six in last. Altogether, it's season five, season two, season one, season three, season seven, season four, and season six. Phew, all right. So which one is better? Why? Does Trollstopia deserve criticism for the lack of broppy and the filler, slow, boring episodes? Since I really looked over everything, I'd have to say that I prefer Trolls the Beat Goes On over Trollstopia. Beat Goes On has a better story. It has season consistency and growth. There's more engagement, the characterization is better for the snack pet members we know, and much more. While Trollstopia is better in episode quality, animation ideas, and songs, the characterization isn't quite where it needs to be. The season consistency is not good. It can be boring at times. It can feel like a waste of time, at times because they do the same old same old. The quantity over quality is distracting. And it lost that Trolls magic I felt originally, because it leads me to the second biggest flaw with Trollstopia. It felt a lot like the creators and writers kind of buckled under their own intentions. When you're given a possibility of doing nearly 200 plus episodes for the show, or you simply don't really know how to work with the ideas fully, or aren't giving it their best shot, it can cause a burnout, which is what happened to the audience. The audience felt a huge burnout and fatigue from all the Trolls content that feels like the same old Trolls stuff they've seen a million times, done much better elsewhere. I don't think that it's anyone's fault that this happened, or that Trollstopia ended up this way because the people making it aren't doing their best with what they could do. But I genuinely felt like this show really could have made some decisions that would have improved it. Maybe cutting a season out, or trimming down season 1 from 13 episodes to 6 or 7, so that other seasons could have those good episodes. Trollstopia felt so much like missed potential that could have explored so much more with the Trolls universe while still giving people an episodic format of all their adventures. Do I think Trollstopia deserves criticism for the slow, boring filler? Yes. Yes, I do. Because if things are boring and feel like a waste of time and isn't interesting to your audience, especially if they're fans, you fall short of your goal. That's a big problem. And if the people behind the 2D shows want to continue making more, which I recommend they don't because I don't want them to suffer the same fate as Trollstopia, they should try to be more like Trollstopia's good qualities and Trolls the Big Goes On combined. Otherwise, people probably aren't going to be sucked into 2D shows anymore. Me and Arifa already think that the more these go on and get worse, the more we see them not as ways of expanding on a universe and exploring a property that could connect with people, but more like something made so that it makes money. Now, do I think Trollstopia deserves criticism for the lack of broppy content? No, I don't. Because I was never really expecting any strong broppy content in the 2D shows to begin with. Cast members have repeatedly said that if you want the broppy moments you're looking for, you should focus on the 3D movies. I can't blame the writers for wanting to focus on the concept of their show, and with what little broppy we get, it feels like enough to justify everything. As they glow with romance, as Ainsley says, they feel like the broppy couple we know from the movies. I was satisfied with the broppy we got. But honestly, with all this being said, I really don't think there needs to be any debate about whether Trolls the Beat Goes On or Trollstopia is better. There should be no fights or anything. Both Trolls the Beat Goes On and Trollstopia have their pros and cons. Both shows have some things that I love, some things I like, some things I dislike, and some things I hate. I only really see Trollstopia as a mixed bag that didn't really work entirely, and I'm glad it ended when it did. Plus, I'm mainly invested in the 3D stuff more, because it's clearly better and I love watching the 3D stuff more. I know that Trolls throughout its movies, shorts, shows, and more has really made themselves known as a franchise that people have grown attached to. While it isn't the best quality from DreamWorks, or the best quality in general, I do see the appeal. And the idea of where they could go with Trolls 3 makes me excited. I'm hoping Trolls 3 is good, and that things will be better for the Trolls fans. 2022 has been some year, and to be honest, here at the end, I still don't know what to make of it. 
there were good moments and bad moments. Overall, I don't think it was a better year than 2021, but I also feel like it was a very reflective year for me. I got to graduate with my bachelor's degree, and it felt like an era has ended. And I'm sure that an era ended for you guys as well. And you all also have your thoughts about how the year turned out. On a personal level, I thought this year was just okay, with a few great moments. From a YouTube perspective, this was my worst year so far. I only got to make about three to five videos this year because of so many circumstantial changes me and Arifa had to make. However, she and I are doing everything we can to get things back on track. I got Arifa plenty of gifts and it felt really nice and beautiful to see the messages and hear Arifa gasping and tearing up with joy at how I did something for someone. Just because I love them and want to do that for them. That's how I feel with Arifa. And it's how I feel when making videos, that I'm doing something I love doing, and I'm giving something to you guys. You may have noticed that my channel, Instagram page, Twitter, and more have all been changed. That my Instagram has had photos and videos and reels archived to where I only have a handful of posts, as well as how my channel's 200 plus videos are now private and gone, to where I only have a few videos. This is because Erifa and I have been cleaning things up. And when Arifa passes the entrance exam they're studying right now, she'll be able to get a new computer, drawing tablet, and more for college. After that, she'll be coming back to edit for me, and we've got so much up our sleeve. Ever since Arifa became my editor and our relationship has grown to where we're boyfriend and girlfriend, she's always wanted what was best for me and this channel, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I want to do more than trolls. I got my start on trolls and so many other different shows and franchises, but I don't want to only be known for that. I want to do so much more. Marvel, Star Wars, animation, and the list could keep on going. I have no idea what 2023 has in store for either of us, but one thing is for sure, we're working our way up every day. We're fighting like hell to make our dreams come true. We're doing everything we can for ourselves, for each other, and for you guys. We wouldn't be where we are today without you all supporting us all the way. We're going to continue working hard, making you proud, and showing you all our true potential. That's a promise. Give Arifa your prayers and put your faith in that she'll pass the exam and continue being good people. We've ended another year. Let's go into another with a new resolve. I'm Party Planner Preston, and Happy New Year to all of you amazing party